Say to the person next to you, who are you looking at? Say to the person on the other side, what are you looking at? Take a seat. What we see affects our lives, doesn't it? It's like if you go into a dodgy pub, who are you looking at? All those eyes turn around. I'm sure you've never been into one. But what we look at affects reality, doesn't it? My dad's just had um, a cataract removed. He's had a couple of cataracts removed from his, his eyes. He said, oh my goodness, I can't believe how much more I can see now. Do I really look like that? So perception is not always reality, but when we have something removed, we can see exactly what it is. I remember when I, I first had glasses, I, I was just, we, we lived on a hill, and you looked out the window, I said, oh my God, I can't believe how far I can see. Somebody changes your lens, and it affects what you're looking at it changes the reality doesn't it many people would have seen a crowd around jesus but the woman with the issue of blood saw a way through there are not too many people there i can get to jesus there may not be a massive thoroughfare but there's a narrow narrow channel through which i can go to touch the hem of his garment. If we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. That's good, isn't it? Say that to the person next to you. Should we say all together? If we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. There was once a workman in a factory, and at the end of his shift, he had a wheelbarrow and he was wheeling this wheelbarrow to the gate. And on the gate, there's a security guard. And the um, security guard says, what's that? And he says, well, I've got this wheelbarrow, and I've got a box of sawdust in, in the, the wheelbarrow. Security guard says, that's a bit odd. Why have you got that? Well, he said, you know, uh, I was just sweeping up the factory floor, just taking all the sweepings, fragments of dust and sort of stuff like that. Uh, and I put them in the box, just got some need for it at home. And the security guard said, OK, then, let's, let's have a look. So he opens up the box in the barrow. And, and indeed, it, it is sawdust. So fair enough, go on your way, no problem. That's day one. Day two, end of the shift, end of the day, same thing. It's coming along, wheelbarrow, uh, box, box. So I said, what, it's you again. What are you doing? He said, ah, oh, well, same again. You know the drill. Uh, I was sweeping up factory floor, the end of the day, got, got all this sawdust, uh, put it in the box, taking it home. He said, okay, mm, better make sure, uh, open the box, please. And he opens a box, rummages through it. It is indeed sawdust. That's day two. Day three, same procedure. So, okay, waves him through. Fair enough. I think it is. Day four, exactly the same. Wheelbarrow, sawdust, box. Fair enough. Day five, security guard says to him, he says, I can't put my finger on it, but I, I think you're stealing. I said, I don't know what you're stealing but this is weird. Uh, um, if you tell me what you're stealing, I won't report you. Man says, okay, all right then. I'm stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> and life can be like that. We focus on the little thing and miss the big thing, the, the big picture. And we can be like that in God, can't we as well? Worried about the finer detail and we miss the big picture that God is doing, the little small things. We need four things in life, insight, foresight, oversight, and hopefully hindsight. Not everybody has hindsight, do they? Older doesn't 
always mean wiser. We, we know that. But insight is detail. So other people might miss it. We, we can see the picture, but it's being able to discern what's in it that really matters. That's insight that's so useful. It's not just looking at it biologically with our eyes, but understanding what we're, we're looking at. Foresight is the ability to see a bit further, isn't it? Like a giant telescope. Sometimes you get in job interviews, don't you? You know, what distinguishes you? Why should I give you the job? Ah, oh, I've got the ability to see round corners. You know, it's very fashionable, isn't it? I see stuff that's sort of coming, you know. So seldom do they genuinely have that skill, but it's a useful skill if you've got it. Like a telescope to see what's coming on the horizon, how useful it is to know what 2025 holds in store for us, isn't it? We can speculate, but it's useful to have an educated guess. Thirdly, oversight. You get that if you were a helicopter. If we were in a, a helicopter or a drone right now over the LTC, we'd get a sense of position, wouldn't we? We're in Wembley. There's Wembley Stadium there. There's Hampstead Heath there. We're, we're in London. So, so you go from the kind of micro up to the macro. And if we had a helicopter, we would have that. And, and hindsight as well. The ability to look backwards and understand what's really gone on. You know, some people don't learn from their mistakes, do they? And they end up repeating the same mistakes. You know, those of us who are, are a little bit older, we're not necessarily a wiser, but we just think, well, I've been this before this, but, you know, been through this before. I know what's going to happen. I have hindsight. You know, there's only really one person who can equip us with all those fabulous things. A and that is God. Each time we engage with God, we have access to all of these attributes. A and I want to focus today and look at who are you looking at? Because who we're looking at and what we're looking at affects what we, what we do. Number one, look up. Can you look up for me now? Look right up. We can't see much beyond the ceiling, but there's much, much more if we were to take the ceiling off. Can you get Psalm 121 up for me, please, if you don't mind? We need to get perspective. We need to look upwards to God. That's the only way when we're so sort of micromanaging our lives all the time, the only way we can get something important, which is perspective. You know, I can say, yep, LTC, it's in Wembley, but unless I've sort of seen it from above, I don't quite know the position. And how much more in God do we need to look and see his perspective for us to get our sense of proportion? Psalm 121, it says this, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from every evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and evermore. You know, the average head weighs 10 pounds. So if your head is always now like this, it's a lot of weight for the body to carry. If you look up higher it's easier to carry it. There was once a, a woman and she was very kind of overwhelmed and oppressed and depressed and weighed down by life. And um, every morning she used to catch the train to work. She used to get out of her house, lock the door, walk to work uh, uh, and um, walk to the train station. And she'd always be looking down. Uh, and she went to the doctor's 
explained her scenario, so oh, I'm really sort of weighted down. A doctor said, look, I want you to, this is what I prescribe. So every morning, I want you, as you're walking to the train station, look at the rooftops. And I want you to do it for a month. She came back after a month and said, you're not going to believe this. I'm transformed. So I can breathe easier. My chest is better. My perspective is better. Just because she looked up. I took Victor, uh, uh, both Sarah and myself, took Victor to New York in May. And um, uh, there's a lot to look. Has anybody been to New York? Um, there's a lot to look at up top, isn't there? Sometimes you're like beetling along the road and, and they have skyscrapers to an amazing extent. So you're, uh, you're looking, you're walking down the kind of sidewalk or whatever, but the buildings are absolutely massive. And um, we did all sorts of things. And um, amongst other things, we went to the Nintendo store. And the Nintendo store it set it up really well. You can go there, you can obviously buy stuff, but you can also go there absolutely for free and just play the games on like a big screen. So you can imagine like how keen he, he was on that, you know, completely free, doesn't sort of cost anything sort of whatsoever, and, and like he really, really loved it. And if anybody's been to New York recently, you probably enjoyed it, but it's, it's seriously expensive. You know, and the hotels particularly expensive, and they are finely, um, they hone the art of, of rinsing you down for cash very, very well. I said, you know, we hadn't paid for breakfast, and um, they said, would you, would you like breakfast on top? I said, well, maybe. What's the charge? I said, $59. What, for all three of us? I said, no, just for one of you. You know, so I said, well, don't worry, we'll, we'll leave that. There's only so much toast, and there's only so many eggs you can eat, you know. And you go with a diner around the corner, you literally, all three of us can eat for $59. You know, they give you, like, is it only place in the world I've ever had like a pot of peanuts they say look we'll give you a free drink it's very nice staying here we'll give you a free drink have what you like so oh thank you very much have one of those thank you uh, and give you like a pot of peanuts and lo and behold the bill cuts said, no we don't need to pay I understand the drinks free but you get charged eleven dollars for the peanuts I thought oh, my goodness that is expensive so I, I took Victor up. Um, Sarah and I had been to New York before. We hadn't taken Victor before. I said, Victor, you're really going to enjoy this. We're going to look at the skyline. We're going to go up the Rockefeller Center. Rockefeller Center is amazing. John D. Rockefeller constructed the whole thing in the 1930s. You know that famous picture of... Um, some of us got it on our wall. You know the pictures of the, the workers on the metal beam. You know, they're all sitting there like this with their lunch but the beam is like hanging hundreds of feet above it's very famous and that was the Rockefeller Center that was being built in the 1930s took them about a decade to construct it and you go to New York now and many buildings there are buildings that are taller than that but it's still really impressive and its location is like Midtown in New York so you, you get a sort of wonderful kind of perspective you know all around kind of New York it's really good I said Victor we're going to enjoy it. Obviously it costs a hundred dollars, everything costs a hundred dollars. So we say we're going to go up, we're going to like it. So you go up in the lift and your ears are kind of popping because you're going up 70 floors, about 850 feet. And we're up there and we're looking at Victor, enjoy this. It's really, really nice. Are you, are you liking it? He says, yes, yes. Okay, fine. So about 10 minutes has gone by and you can see he's like ailing a little bit. I said, would you like a packet of crisps? So anyway, I buy him a packet of crisps and an orange juice or whatever. That spins things out for another kind of five minutes or so. I said, look, you can look south. You can look at New Jersey. You can look upstate New York. Look, this is incredible. This was all done in, in the 1930s. So anyway, by this, it's about 25 minutes. He said, C can we go, go back down now, please? So I said, look, we spent a hundred dollars on, on, this, on this thing. So anyway, I said, is there anything else? you'd like to do anything else you'd like to see they said I'd like to go to the Nintendo store please so we go all the way back down and spent for free an hour and a half just playing video games you know it's the very definition of not being focused on the big picture but focusing on the micro he didn't want to look up or along, he wanted to look down, bless him. But you know, he's seven, that's what he likes doing. But it just shows we can get so focused 
on the micro that we miss the macro and particularly when life is hectic it is crazy particularly when we lose our bearings we need to look upwards at God for his perspective he is our our anchor he is our our leader our savior he knows what he's doing Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Too many of us, we, we seek all sorts of things on our phones, but we need to seek the face of Almighty God up there. Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes, you know, I love getting up high. I like being up high in big building. I like heights because it gives you a sense of perspective. So when you're up there in that sky, so you're looking, you, you can't really even see people, but you can just about see like a few people on the big thoroughfares. They're like little ants in, in the distance. But you realise crumbs, all the problems, the things I think about, it puts it in perspective when we look upwards. Be still and know that I am God. You know, I'd rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. Direction two. We've looked up. Direction two is really important. Look in. Say to the person next to you, look in. God doesn't judge by outward appearances, but he looks at the heart. And that's why in Harvest we spend so long dealing with the, the heart so rightly because it, it controls so much of what we do. Psalm 139, 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, God is someone who knows what he's doing when it comes to heart surgery. Know my anxieties. God knows us better than we know ourselves. There's all sorts of courses you can do, all sorts of books you can read that are, you know, understand the real you. You know, you need to know self-knowledge, self-awareness is so important. And it is important that there's somebody who knows us even better than we know ourselves. That is God hit himself and only by putting ourselves on God's operating table can our heart really be properly examined you know we talked about insight to be insightful you have to know what you're doing you know we had an electrician round recently and to me it just looks like a tangle of tangle of cables but to him of course it all makes sense because he has insight to know what he's looking at to me it's a load of you know the the red cable and the brown one is it do you connect the brown one there or do you absolutely not connect? i don't know which it is but he knows because he has insight and god brings that understanding to us we need God's microscope only with the microscope of God can we see things we'd never be able to spot with the naked eye you know, I had a friend once and um, when I look up at the sky I just see stars you know they're very nice but I don't know what they are you know some people say oh I can see the the plow of Orion and this and that and and I say I can't see any of this stuff even on a clear night but when I stand next to him he says here it is you say oh yeah I can see all of that stuff and for as long as he's there I can see it but I tried the next night I couldn't see anything but because he has the understanding and the wisdom if I'm with him I will see the right stuff uh, you see, looking at things is not always perception. And it's very important that we have God with us in order to look inside. His spirit in us should produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. How fruity are you as a Christian? You've got lots of lovely fruit. Yeah, if you were a bottle of wine and we took the cork off, 
with the bouquet be lovely. Oh, lovely fragrance there. Let's pour some out. Taste some. The, the length of the wine is, is really top quality. Or would you return it to the waiter? They say, sorry, mate. I think this is corked. It's funny, musty odours in here. It looks nice. It's a lovely red colour. But the colours are a little bit off. They're, they're a bit weird. What fruit do we manifest? Are we fruity as Christians? So we need to look upwards, look inwards with God. And the other thing I want to focus on is look backwards. Look backwards. Some people don't like looking backwards, but it matters. John 1.29 said this. It said, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him. And said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He recognised the Lamb of God for who he was. I was once in the, um, the West End and um, you don't see them very much. I always like those businesses advertised on vans. You know, um, you know something like Bill Smith and Sons. You know, a sense of, you know, you've got father and son doing the, the same business. You know, sometimes they say on the little advert how long the business has been established. And, and hopefully it's some time in the far off distance, you know, been going since 1987 or something like this. But there's a painter and decorator's van. And they said, oh, it's been established since, since 2016. I thought, well, that's not particularly impressive, really. I mean, it's, it's quite good, but you're looking for, like, longevity, aren't you, with, with the business. You're able to look back at it and you think, well, we were in the West End at the time. You could go to Fortnum and Mason's, the department store, that were, were all dated all the way back to 1707. And you think, wow, they've known what it's like to trade through good times and bad times. Not just the Second World War and the First World War, but the Napoleonic War. You know, recessions, depressions, booms, busts, the whole lot. Don't you think, like, in all that time, they would have accrued some pretty good knowledge as to, to how to survive? Just because of sort of sheer longevity. They were founded in 1707. You know, William Fortnum, he was a footman to Queen Anne, and he had a sort of side business as a grocer. And Queen Anne, being a monarch, you can do anything you like as a monarch in the 1700s, she, she liked fresh candles every night. So she said, oh, don't mind what you do, but make sure the candles are new every night. And of course, they don't burn all the way down. So there's lots of leftover wax. And he thinks, well, I've got a side business as a grocer. I'm going to flog off all, all this wax to other people. And he made a lot of money. Uh, and he expanded his business, met met Hugh Mason, and they started out in 1707, and did all sorts of things. Uh, they say they invented the Scotch egg. It was like the early sort of fast food. So they were based in St. James's, want some fast food, no Big Macs around at the time. They said, I, I create an egg surrounded by deep fried meat, and you can take it westwards on your journey. But all sorts of things. But it's an amazing history when you look back at it. And that's only from 1707. You know, Christianity is 2,000 years old. Are you a satisfied customer with Christianity? Do you want to stand for me here? If you're satisfied with God, satisfied with how Christianity has unfolded, stand. If, if that's you. If you're one of those satisfied customers. Yes. And I would stand as well. I've seen Christianity through thick and thin work for me. I don't always understand everything that the Lord is doing, but, but I've seen it work through thick and thin when I deserved it, when I didn't deserve it, perhaps particularly when I didn't deserve it. I've seen it work in other people's lives, the power of the supernatural. I am a satisfied customer, and satisfied customers tell other people, don't they? This is good. This is worthwhile. Come and see that the Lord is good. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. (laughs) 
So do take a seat. We need to look back, don't we? We need to look back. There was once a friend of mine, and um, he took his four-year-old into one of those shops. And you know it's one of those shops that have a big, big sign, white background, red letters, always. Breakages must be paid for. And I thought, it's foolhardy to go in here, stupid. But nonetheless, I will go in, because we need to get a Mother's Day present for Mum. And his four-year-old was, was in there. And if you've ever had, like, young kids, you know, they're always in a place where there's lots of delicate, expensive... Do not touch. Fragile, expensive. Uh, how many of you know they will always make a beeline to, to the, the expensive, fragile thing? And anyway, he's searching for a gift... For, for, for mum, that you know, he can get for his son to give to mum. Uh, and out of the corner of his eye, he sees his four year old ha has run off uh, and he's picking up, picking up this, this China thing. Doesn't even know what it is, but he just, oh no, that's the wrong thing to, to, to pick. And before he you knows, he's, 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 he, he said, Tom, be careful with that. And he's like, slips slightly and cracks something on. And before they can run out of the shop or do anything like that, the manager just appears. He doesn't say anything, he just points, points like this to the sign. And so you break it, you've bought it. And he thought, well, I could at that point disown my son, pretend he's not my son, walk out. So I've never seen him before. I just don't. I've, Came in here, I don't know. I, I hope his parents are around and hide, hide round the corner, you know. Could say, well, look, in fairness, he has some savings. He's four, but he's cashing an ice away. He could pay, pay for the damage himself. But the reality is the four-year-old's done it, but dad has to pay for it. There is no other way than dad paying. It's as simple as that. And we're in that situation with Jesus, aren't we? He is the, the, the crux of our faith. We look backwards to a historical fact in order to access the present reality and supernatural power of Jesus. You know, I have a friend at work and he says, you know, we do this sort of thing, you know, just because you, you know, just because you come to church, you know, doesn't make you a Christian. And he says, surely if you go to church, it does make you a Christian. You know, if you spend enough time in the garage, maybe you do become a car. And to say to him, no, it's a, it's a supernatural change because Christianity can be lots of things, but it, it's not really Christianity unless our faith is founded on the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ. So it's important that we look back in the right way to what God has done, otherwise we will never be able to access in the present day exactly what God has done for us. Direction four. So we've looked upwards at what God does. We've looked inwards. We've looked backwards. But we also need to look around us. It's not just me, myself and I. Matthew 5.14, it said, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And we need to permeate the gospel wherever we go. We can't always preach it. We can't always do it by words. But we certainly can do it by deeds. You know, some people create happiness wherever they go. Some people create happiness whenever they go. You think, oh, thank goodness they've gone. You know, whatever goes on, we've got a vibe, haven't we? And we spread that vibe. And maybe it's the fragrance of Jesus. Maybe it's the fragrance of something else. We, we don't know. But it's important that we look around and we permeate the gospel. Lewis, would you like to come forward? We were talking in cell this week because um, Lewis has been doing an incredible thing, just witnessing to people. And God set you a challenge, didn't he, Lewis? Do you want to just share what the challenge was and how it's unfolded? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, earlier this summer, my wife and I went to Rodney Howard Brown Holy Ghost Conference and we received an impartation to do street evangelism. And we went out there and uh, we was expecting 100 souls to come to the Lord. At first we were a bit hesitant, but um, 
we got into it and funny enough Jesus he empowered us to lead a hundred people to the Lord and all glory to the Lord you know I think, I, I think people are more hungry and open to the gospel in this day and age than than what we may be aware of and um, ultimately people need the love of God to know that God loves them and that Jesus died for them and uh, he's a good God all praise to Jesus yeah, yeah. hallelujah Thank God bless you. thanks Lord it's about looking around isn't it and as well as looking around we need to do something else which is look ahead at what God has for us. It's not a faith that just looks backwards, critical though that is, but we're about looking ahead at what God will do. 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are seen are eternal. You know, God is preparing us and preparing you and me. You know, we fix our eyes on Jesus who is coming back for his bride, the church. And you get some Christians who say, oh, I don't do church. Yeah, especially since COVID, I just listen to Joyce Meyer on the internet, this sort of thing. Lovely. But Joyce Meyer is not gonna pray for you when you become unwell not going to pray for you when you have needs you know, there's no substitute for church you know how does God refer to the church in the Bible as the bride coming back as a glorious beautiful bride how would the bridegroom feel if you say oh I think the bride's not so good yeah don't like her really dress is a bit weird and look very nice you know, and there are many Christians think, oh, church isn't perfect, I'll give it a miss. Yeah, let's go on the internet, find something better. You always find something better on the internet. But you can't find something that replaces that gathering of the people being there. You're shaped, I'm shaped. God is shaping us together. We look forward to the return of Christ. Jesus knocks at the door of our hearts today and says not just will you let me in not just can I be resident but can I be president there's so many people you know they love to let Jesus in there you go Jesus in the front room the nice room don't look at anything else or bung him in the wardrobe in case of emergency break glass get Jesus out like a little figurine please ward off trouble thank you very much no Jesus wants to have full access in every room of our hearts. We need to look up, look in. Look back, look around. But we also need to look ahead to what God has for us. So easy to be focused on the little things. But God says, look, I have more for you. More for you than you could ever imagine. You know, when we get there and look over the crest of the hill, we see, wow, there's loads more than I ever imagined. When I got glasses, I could see the bottom of the hill. Couldn't believe it. Thought everybody just had that view. Not very far. But when we put on the lens of God, we see where else he's going to take us. Can we stand in his presence? Let's close our eyes. Lord, I want to thank you that you give me heavenly perspective. Spec savers do a good job, but they don't do anything compared to the work that you do in giving us a new lens to see through, that we're loved and forgiven in you. And Lord, that you repair things within our lives that need repair and renewal. And Lord, you point us forward to the future. To a future we could not have managed without you. 
And Lord, you have saved us and blessed us and ministered to us in your mighty and your wonderful name. And Lord Jesus, I pray for heavenly perspective over our lives this day and forevermore. That Lord, we wouldn't get bogged down in the detail, but Lord, in you we would be scanning the far horizon for all you want us to be and all you want us to do. And right now we talk there about God knocking on the door of our lives. And some of us, we've done a good job of, of letting him in. We've got more to go, but, but, but he's, he is resident and he's sometimes president. But there are some of us who've never let him in. That when God, knock, 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 we're not sure we've actually even opened the front door to let him over the threshold. That's you today. We want to give you a chance to respond to the Lord and to ask him fully into our hearts. So just whilst every eye is closed, there's anybody in that category today, you've heard God knocking, but you're not entirely sure whether you bothered to open the door. Just silently, just pop your hand up, just so I know you're there. God sees it, I see it. Every other eye is closed, so they, they don't, no one else will spot it. This is between you and the Lord, but we want to acknowledge that. If that's you, put your hand up, and we're going to pray together, if we will. Everybody ready to pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love for me. That Lord, your oversight over me is 360 degrees. You know my past, my present and my future. And you've come to give me glorious hope. And Lord, I ask you into my life right now. And I pray for your forgiveness for all that I've done wrong. And I pray that you would be my Lord and Saviour from this day forevermore. In your mighty name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.